Okay, thank you, Nate. Um, so I'm Laura and I'm at the University of Alabama. So um, I wanted to give you an update on some of the ideas that we're working on with the Pathways Project today. And the Pathways Project is sort of a, a catch-all phrase to describe how we are looking at metabolic and signaling pathway genes and how they evolve. But we're for now mostly focused on the insulin signaling pathway as a starting point. So, sorry, I figured out the right thing here. There we go. So many um, network architectures, uh, as in genetic architectures, can produce the same phenotypic outcome. So this is a and just a, a sort of big picture puzzle that that I'm interested in learning more about. So the example we have here is a house. So this house has the same phenotype, that is, it is a house, um, but the underlying architecture can be different. And what the architecture is can define how the, um, the organism or the house can both deal with per perturbation within its lifetime. So um, if it's got uh, a big windstorm comes through, if it's got a simple architecture, it's much more likely to fall over. If it has a complex architecture, it's gonna be more robust to that perturbation. But conversely, if it needs to change in response to um, a long-term evolutionary pressure, the one that has more, more simple architecture may be able to respond to that pressure more easily um, because it's a more straightforward structure to um, modify. And so what we would predict that there would be a relationship between the um, structure of the, of the phenotype and how evolvable and, and robust the phenotype might be. So when we start talking about structures um, in biological systems, we can start thinking about networks. And so networks have been studied a lot in many contexts, including biological. And um, some, a pattern that's emerging that seems to be generally true across the board is that networks um, tend to have a hub and spoke architecture, meaning that there's a few nodes that have, I think I lost my, there we go, all right. A few nodes that have um, high connectivity, those are the hubs, and then many nodes that have low connectivity. So these are spokes only connected in most cases to one other node. Um, and this, this architecture seems to be a consistent thing across biological networks. Um, and we've also learned that there's a correlation between the number of or the, the hubbiness of a gene and its rate of protein evolution. So this is looking specifically at the human protein protein interaction network and the rate of evolution, which is on the y axis here, decreases um, as the number of physical interactions within the protein protein network increases. And again, this is a pattern that's been found in other for other systems and in other biological networks. So this seems to be a general pattern that we see that protein evolution is um, related to the structure of the network. So another idea I want to introduce is the idea of how, how evolution affects duplicated genes. So um, when I was a, an undergrad, this model actually was, came out when I was an undergrad and I was, it was pretty exciting because I was there sitting in the classroom the first time it was presented at my, at my institution, University of Oregon. Um, but it's the duplication, degeneration, and complementation model. And it's there's more sophisticated ways to think about this that have come out more recently, but this is a good, good starting point, which is the idea that um, many of the functions of a gene are determined by its regulatory region. And if you duplicate a gene, which is indicated um, in this figure uh, here, um, it's possible then that those different regulatory regions, which are indicated by these smaller boxes, could um, mod change in function. So one possibility is that they all, one of those copies could lose all of its um, function in that category. So leading to a, essentially a non-functionalization of that particular copy. Um, you could have neo-functionalization where you gain um, a new uh, function in, in one of the copies um, in terms of gene regulation or um, sub-functionalization where they basically partition the, the original work that the ancestral gene did um, in, across the two copies. And there are other scenarios too that could happen. It's sort of the basic idea. So we come to the insulin signaling pathway. Um, so the insulin signaling pathway is a really good place for us to start, um, in part because it's very well conserved across metazoans and obviously has significant medical um, and, and biological importance to how metazoans uh, regulate their metabolism. Uh, it's also very well characterized in Drosophila conveniently. And 
Also, um, many of the genes in the pathway have undergone duplications and losses across the Drosophila genus. So this means we have a well-characterized network that also has gene duplications and losses. So it's a, it's a good place to start looking at how these factors interact with each other in terms of um, the, the rate that the genes evolve. So in the insulin signaling pathway in particular, we know that the rate of prote protein evolution, that is the coding region evolution rate, um, is highest at the top of the insulin signaling pathway. So um, if you think of the pathway as a cascade um, coming down, the things that are earliest in the cascade are evolving at the highest rates, and the things later in the cascade are evolving um, more slowly, that mean, meaning they're more evolutionarily constrained. Um, and so this is a pattern that seems to be holding up across other, other systems as well. Um, and so this gives us a baseline for what we might predict would happen for the regulatory regions in, in this group of species. So what we're doing in our project then is to look at not just how the protein regions evolve, but also thinking about how the regulatory regions evolve. Um, so the basic approach is that we're starting with the insulin signaling because we have these well annotated um, genes across Drosophila. And there are some basic predictions we have. We, we predict faster evolution of the regulatory regions early in the insulin signaling pathway, similarly to how we saw the faster evolution of the uh, protein sequences. And we expect greater constraint for genes with many interacting partners that are hub genes within the network. Faster evolution in recent duplicated gene, recently duplicated genes, but constrained in older duplicates. Um, I won't go into the details of why that is, but basically we expect um, early on there be, to be fast evolution in those regulatory regions. And um, we expect there to be a correlation of regulatory and structural change with other properties of the gene, such as things like expression level. So um, many studies have shown that, among other things, that influence protein uh, rate, evolution rate, is the level at which the gene is expressed. Um, and so we're currently looking at this across all of the species we have browsers for, so 27 species beyond Drosophila um, lanagaster. Um, and this is where we are. Um, we have those 27 species we've identified are, um, are focusing on 63 genes. So this is basically all the genes that are identified by Flybase as being in the insulin signaling pathway, plus a few others that I know are related, um, including the insulin proteins themselves. Um, so that comes up with about 1,700 unique projects. So we'd say we're going to have at least two copies per project or two two models, two students working on each project. That's about 3,400 total projects. If we were to do all of them, we don't necessarily need to do all of them, but that's, that's the, the pool we can pull from. At present, we have 162 projects that have been claimed uh, two or more times, um, nearly 300 that have been claimed once, and um, nearly 400 that have been submitted. So those are the ones that we're starting to work on uh, reconciling right now. And more than 20 faculty have been part of this project thus far. So we're working on the reconciliation right now. So I have um, six students from my lab here at the University of Alabama, as well as two students working with us um, from with, that have been working with Lindsay Long. And they're working with us on this reconciliation process. And they are building into that process um, the generation of the micropublications that you heard about yesterday from Chin Mei. So Chin Mei has been working really hard on um, develop integrating the documentation for how to reconcile it while simultaneously producing the micropublication. Um, in terms of our project specifically, one of my goals for the summer is to streamline um, the project options to focus more precisely on the most scientifically motivated projects for the, sh for the short term. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that we know that we have a new Drosophila pathway annotation walkthrough. So Katie worked really hard on this um, over, over the winter. Uh, to make something that was very user friendly. We've gotten good feedback on it thus far. Um, so it's a really, really great step by step guide to take your students through what the process is to annotate a gene for this project. Um, and all of our most up to date training materials and the corresponding online tools. So we have some specialized tools like a specialized gene model checker um, are available or linked from the Pathways Project page on the GEP website. So some of the likely next steps in the Pathways Project will be to generate long read RNA sequencing and perhaps some proteomic data. So Nate highlighted um, just, just now the usefulness of proteomic data and I've started seeing some examples where I really wish I had it um, to, to clarify uh, the right start, start code on, for example, when it's ambiguous in a well-diverged gene. 
And um, this will help us improve those full transcript isoform predictions in the species that are especially distant from Melanogaster. So short read RNA-seq is just not good enough to do accurate um, predictions of, of the whole transcript, the whole isoform. And so we really need that long read sequencing to improve those predictions. Uh, in the lab, I imagine that we can start working on confirming any novel isoform expression in vivo. And I'm thinking that this potentially could be a good wet lab project, um, a CURE project for, for GEP students as a wet lab extension to the, the Pathways project. So something um, I'd be interested in talking to those of you that might be interested in thinking about that more. Um, eventually, we will expand our analysis to other pathways. So the insulin pathway is just an N of one. We want to think about pathways more generally and what kind of properties um, how those properties of the pathway influence the gene evolution, such as the pathway structure, for example. And um, within my lab especially, and then potentially um, developing into GEP projects, also going to be thinking about um, the way the genes evolve within species, or that is the population variation within species using population genomic data sets. Because um, there, there, we expect there to be a relationship between the amount of variation observed within species and the amount of divergence we see between species. So if you are going to be involved in this project, the basic overview first step is the claim a project. So we don't have a real slick uh, claim system yet. That's one of the things that's on Chinmay's to-do list. So for now, uh, we have a Trello board to organize the project as a whole. Um, though remember that most of the, um, all the critical tools that you need to actually do the project are linked from the GEP website, with the one exception of the actual project claim form, which we have as a, as a protected Google Sheet. So this is a screenshot from that Google Sheet. Um, so basically all you do if you want to do one of these projects is add your name to the claim by column um, for whichever gene and gene species combination you're interested in doing. Um, some of the information that's on here is that might be of interest is the challenge level. So the challenge level is um, a complicated nonlinear calculation based on the number of isoforms and the number of um, uh, exons and the divergence from Drosophila melanogaster as a way to estimate how hard the project might be um, as, a, as a first pass. So eight is hardest and one is easiest. But again, I want to emphasize this nonlinear. So uh, in the eight category, there's lots of large range of difficultness <laughs> across, across the eights. Um, once you have claimed your project, um, within the, the walkthrough, we'll take you through this exactly, but the basic step then is to find the correct ortholog for the, species, for the gene that you're working on in your target species. And so we um, do this with a blast against the whole genome of the target species. Uh, so we can identify the correct um, assembly or scaffold for the likely ortholog. So to confirm that we have the right gene as the ortholog, um, among the things we think about is the genomic neighborhood. So if the genomic neighborhood of your target, um, of, your, of the gene you think might be the ortholog of your focus gene, if, the, if it's the if the region is syntenic with what you see in melanogaster, that is the genes flanking your target gene remain the same as they do in this particular example, um, then it's a good chance that you have the correct ortholog. So if you have um, one good blast match and um, evidence of syntony, you can be pretty confident you have the ortholog. If it gets ambiguous though, when you start having um, one of those pieces of evidence not being clear, such as more than one good blast hit, so that could indicate a gene duplication event, um, Sometimes you can use Synthony to help clarify uh, whether which, which of those duplicates is most likely to be more, most um, homologous to the target gene. Um, and it's possible also that you've lost the gene, that the gene's been lost from your species, if there's no good blast match and, and um, lack of any syntenic evidence. Uh, I mean, that you can find the syntenic region and the gene's not there, basically. You can be pretty, pretty confident the gene was lost. Um, so those are just some of the things that go into that first step. Then we annotate the genes more or less the same way you would for any um, GEP project. Um, some specific tweaks we have to do is we have a different gene model checker because the underlying data we're comparing to is different from the classical F element project checker, but that's, um, it's, again, it's all linked from the GEP website. And um, ultimately then you prepare a report for the, um, and submit it back to the pathways box folder where we're collecting projects. So some things you might consider as additional add-ons. Um, you can annotate the TSS regions or annotate the full transcripts. 
Right now, the, we only ha really have good enough data to support that robustly with species that are closely related in the Lanagaster, where we have su sufficient um, similarity at the nucleotide level to be fairly confident um, in those uh, predictions. And um, ultimately, when you submit the project, you're going to be submitting it as four files. Um, you the report, which is um, similar to the F-Element report, and then the GFF, peptide, and transcript files all go, go to the box folder. Some strategies for intimate implementing in the classroom. Um, this is not, not an exhaustive list, but some things with possibilities. Would be to do something like to assign several genes in one species to one person or group. Um, so you might choose those genes based on proximity in the pathway or based on some kind of similarity of molecular function if you wanted to focus on that conceptually. Or you could assign paralog. So if you know there's been a gene duplication, you might assign um, both copies of, of the gene in a given species to, to your group. Um, or another possibility might be just assign the same gene in different species to different people or in serial to the same person or group. Um, and people have done this, have, have done by, started by doing something close related in Melanogaster and then moving out from Melanogaster across the phylogeny, just thus demonstrated how conservation um, decreases as you diverge from Melanogaster. Um, and you could potentially focus on a gene of, of functional interest too. So if, if you're really excited about Chico as a gene, you could claim, claim Chico for um, a bunch of student projects, for example, and have them think about that gene function in particular. So I just wanna say thank you very much to Wilson, Shimei, and Katie, who have all worked really hard on um, bringing this project up to speed. Um, and the GP faculty participants, I hope I have a fairly complete list here. I apologize if I happen to miss somebody. Um, I think this was everybody that was on the claim sheet when I checked uh, earlier today. Um, so please uh, feel free to join us. And among the things I would love to get some feedback about is whether people would be interested in um, sort of a, sh a quick training session on how to actually go through this, do this project, this type of um, pathways project with um, their students such they might be able to implement this fall. So that's something we might be able to get organized for later this summer. And I will leave it at that. Are there any questions? Uh, Laura, uh, can, can I ask if the main goal is to look at evolution of uh, regulatory regions, like is the plan then to go back once the CDS is annotating, uh, annotated and add TSS? Is that the plan? Like, should we be trying if we can to get the TSS done as well on these. Yeah, so if, so, so if you're interested, I mean, if, if it fits your pedagogical goals and if the species is fairly close related to Melanogaster, then the TSS annotation makes sense, especially in the species where we've done TSS annotations for the F element. We've got the data to support TSS annotations in those species. Um, but trying to spend a bunch of energy on that in the more highly diverged species until we get that long read RNA-seq data um, is, just going to be frustrating for everybody. <laughs> I think I was missing the part that you have a different way to go after, like with the long read transcript, right, RNA seq. That that's how you plan on getting that. Right, that's how we plan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Laura. It's yeah. Kathy. Um, so, publication. Sorry, look a mess. Um, <laughs> For the micro publications, are they more suited towards one gene for more than one species or for a bunch of genes in a single species or have we sorted that out yet? So, so the micro publication unit is one gene, one species. Gotcha. So um, we might have 27 publications about Chico across each of the, each species. Um, okay. So that's, yeah, that's the unit that we're operating on currently. All right, it might be that for other projects, we want to think about other ways to, to organize the micropublications, but for the, the first step here, it's just the coding region of one gene, one species. Can you give us a sense what like your students can do in say like 10 weeks or five weeks or like how, how much, how do you sort of chunk the workload for that? So for me, when I teach this under normal conditions, I'm teaching it in an advanced uh, integrated genomics course. So these are students that are juniors and seniors for the most part. There's a few graduate students in there, but they're incidental. Um, and it's basically half wet lab, half dry lab in terms of the content that we're working through. Um, and so the GEP is the, is the dry lab half of that. And I try to have wet lab stuff that complements what we're doing in GEP. Um, but so basically um, approximately half of our lab time 
is spent doing GEP activities. Uh, we, I, after going through the UEG modules and the BLAST um, tutorial, we, I assign them, um, ultimately they get three genes, but I them, have them do one gene and I try to identify the simplest gene of their three to start with. Um, and then they'll do two more before the end of the semester. So there's lots of rounds of, they turn in a, a draft report and I give them feedback on what's right or wrong with the report and back and forth. Um, and the first year I piloted this, we ran out of time to actually do the TSS annotations, um, but we did go through the TSS uh, modules. This last time I taught it, um, we did do the TSS annotations, which is partly where I realized that trying to do that with those mu very much more diverse species is just a mess. <laughs> trying to get students to feel comfortable making a call about what transcript is which is just too tough. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so, so I was able to get all the way through that with three genes, coding region and the TSS. And the way I organized it is um, I had teams of two to three students and so within that team, this, each student had a different species, but they had the same genes so that they could compare notes to some extent there. I also tried to associate the difficulty of the species with what I suspected the um, challenge level the student would be comfortable with as well. So if I perceived that a student was gonna be a little more advanced, I would give them a slightly more challenging species um, just to yeah, help, help keep it interesting for them. And that's a 16 week semester, so. Okay, I think probably we should move on. So uh, Wilson, 